Uh, we want to now turn to the State of the uh, Church address, State of the Conference address. This is something I requested when I came because I think a conference needs to get a kind of a look back of where we've been, kind of assess where we are as we look forward. So um, let's uh, prepare for the State of the, uh, the Church address, and I think Jessica Vargo will kick this off. Good afternoon. There will be several of us that will be part of the State of the Conference address, and it's my pleasure to start us off. And if I'm speculating, I will say after you hear what I have to say that you're going to be thrilled that I'm done with. 2014 brought in a pay-in rate of 83.42%, which technically is the highest pay-in rate we've had for 20 years. Now, if I round that to 83%, then you can see by the graph that we've been relatively flat for the last several. A flat pay-in rate would indicate that our budget is at the level that it should be in order for us to sustain. Last year, we were able to pay our general church apportionments in full again. This makes year number nine, which is also positive. We also had our emergency reserve that ended again at the recommended level, which is also good news. Our health care reserve ended the year at $3.1 million. This is down from the 2013 level of $3.6 million. Still a good level for our plan size. Basically, anything over $3 million is good. When we take a look at last year's in terms of health care, it wasn't a matter of having high health care costs, but rather it was a shifting or incurring of costs from a population of retirees that had different funding that caused the hit to our reserve. Looking at 2015 to date, we seem to be back to normal with high claims and high utilization. For 2015, as a reminder, our active premiums were increased. We are looking for a plan change for retirees for 2016. That will come before you tomorrow. We are not suggesting any type of premium increase for actives for 2016, which is good news for the local church. And we are actually looking at a premium reduction for retirees for next year. Last year, we had a return on investment of 4%. This compares to 17% in 2013, so a significant change. I'm sure many of you experienced something similar in your own personal account last year due to the market. Return on investment does play a critical role in our various reserve balances. When we take a look, even though we edged up slightly in pay-in, we actually had less churches that were able to pay 100% last year. 66% compared to 68% the year before. After having many years where we were stuck at 65%, we spiked up a few years ago, but now we seem to be heading back down. We had less money that was contributed to the shared ministry challenge goal. And it's this challenge goal that is a major reason why we have been able to pay our general church apportionments in full these past nine years. Less churches paying 100% in the challenge goal, these two facts from last year are a concern for the future. Camp ministry was a financial concern last year. We had a noticeable drop in summer camp registrations, which translated into a similar drop in bottom line. We have new marketing efforts that have been put into place this year, and we're seeing some signs of improvement. Obviously, we will continue to monitor this for continued improvement in the future. 2015 to date, our apportioned shared ministry pay-in rate is slightly down, less than 1%, but nonetheless, not great. Later this week, we will be bringing before you the 2016 budget. This again is at the same level now for 11 years. As we talked about last year, we are committed to maintaining a budget at this level and being aggressive with managing benefits to keep as much money as possible in the local church. The annual conference continues to strive to use the resources and areas of growth in order to promote vitality. So as we've left the budget flat for these, all these years and left that money in the local church, how has that worked out for the local church? Well, if I take a look at numbers like professions of faith, baptisms, membership, worship attendance, then I would have to say not very well because we continue to drop in all of these areas. As you can see, professions of faith dropped 6%. Baptisms, 8%, or rather 9%. Membership and worship attendance, 23 and 3.7% respectively. 
These declines are at a faster and steeper pace than the denominational average. I'm wondering if any of you have read the recent Pew Research Center report or the recent report that came out from the denomination's economic advisory group. The Pew report talks about an increase in the number of Americans that are not affiliated with the church and the decrease in the various religious, religious groups. The economic advisory group reports that the denomination's declining trend, the next 15 years are critical in order for the denomination to be vital past that time frame. And considering that East Ohio is dropping at a faster pace, it makes it this time frame even more critical. If you read the Pew Report, then you know that the United Methodist Church is not alone in this reality. But the crisis is still real and one that needs to be addressed. Economists are projecting that if we do not make strides to turning it around by 2030, then a turnaround is not likely possible. And by 2050, the denomination will collapse. It's not very pleasant to think about, certainly not uplifting, but it is real and one that cannot be ignored. So where do we go from here? At the annual conference level, we are stable. Actually, we are financially stronger than many of our counterparts. But as I've mentioned in the past, the annual conference stability is not an indicator of the current stability of our local churches. At the annual conference level, we are seeing improvements around youth, young adults, young clergy recruitment, and we have churches showing exciting growth. But those churches showing great growth are not enough to carry the load for East Ohio long term. All churches need to make strides. Our churches have their own inherent challenges. We're in East Ohio, which geographically is a challenge all on its own. Many of our churches are not in an optimum location like they were back in the 1950s. Many of our churches are landlocked or they're no longer central to where the population is. Too many of our churches have too high in staffing cost, operating cost, and consequently a portion shared ministry. They tend to operate inward. They do not have resources for programs, mission, and outreach. Our churches need to have a long-term plan, not just how are we going to make it through the year, but a long-term, multi-year plan. Early in October, I will be having a training that will include helping the churches look at their structure objectively. We cannot be short-sighted. If we are, then our efforts to become vital are very slim. But a turnaround is still possible. We have critical mass. We have resources. There is hope as long as leadership does not lose the hope. And leadership is both clergy and laity. And hope does not mean that we continue doing things like we've always done and hope for improvement. Hope means that with God guiding us and the church taking the risk to step outside, we can make a difference. We can find the future and new direction of the United Methodist Church. In addition to being the conference treasurer, I am also the president of the school board in my local community. Two weeks ago, I shared with the graduating class at commencement. And as I thought about what I shared with them that day, I realized that there were some elements of that speech that were very appropriate for this body as well. I encouraged the graduating class to find their passion, their joy, that it would only be then that they would be able to change the world. I challenged them to let that be their legacy, to be a blessing for others. Friends, I want the United Methodist Church to continue to impact lives and to change the world. I want that to be our legacy. I challenge us to be a blessing to others and to help others find Christ through the United Methodist Church. If we find our passion with God, making disciples and modeling that for others, a turnaround is no longer a question of if, but simply a matter of when. Thank you. Well, hello, East Ohio. I'm Steve Court, Director of Connectional Ministries, and I'm wearing my purple tie in honor of Paul. 
It's a joy today to be here. And what I want you to think about is how you find your passion and where you find the Holy Spirit in the places that you live. I want to share with you a story. A couple of weeks ago, a very good friend of mine phoned me late at night. She serves on the secretarial staff in the Greater New Jersey Conference, sitting down here like our good folks are doing. And at the end of the session, as she went to go off of the stage just to wrap up things, somebody ran down the aisle and ran up and grabbed her and hugged her and said, you don't remember me, but you were one of the people with the team from East Ohio who helped clean out my house during Hurricane Sandy. He said, I can't tell you what a difference that made. It gave me hope when I was lost. And I can't hardly tell you how many people since then I've helped muck out their houses. And I want you to know that next year, I'm going to be back in my own home. Wow. You see, you see hope when you've touched a life that changes a life. You see hope when you experience God working in our communities. So one of the struggles is that so many things we measure relate to the institution inside the church on Sunday morning. How can we transform that to go outside the church into the community, out to where Jesus is already working and all we have to do is catch the wave, catch the spirit. Now I'm like you, I feel those storms are brewing. And I'm wondering about the foundations we build our homes on. I'm wondering about whether we're like that, you know, great VBS story you've heard, I build my house on a rock or on the sand. Well, ours is built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, and I want to thank you for that. But I want you to remember that some years ago, Bishop Hopkins asked us, are we an institution or are we a movement? Are we a people who's trying to just sustain United Methodism? Or are we a people who believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ is expressed through the means of grace God has given us to serve and serve well? How many of you have been on a mission team in the last couple of years? Raise your hand. How many of you have had new people experiencing baptism in your church? Raise your hand, look around. Do you see that God's Spirit is moving, but our struggle is how to go beyond just an immediate experience of Jesus Christ into a systematic, consistent growth? We say in congregational development that the three major steps are that we invite people in to become part of the body of Christ that we help people to grow up and mature to become more like Jesus. And then as we mature, we are challenged then to reach out to others so they can know the God who has loved us still loves them. And we are doing that, East Ohio. I want you to know that we've aligned resources, we've restructured things, we've shaken some things up. Kelly Brown is director of uh, our Congregational Vitality is working with you and with a variety of people and sources. One of the things we're doing is boosting the compass group process so that we understand what it is God is calling you to do. That means you communicate to your superintendent and to Kelly so we can network people, so we can support and encourage one another because you're never going to make it through the storm if you do it alone. You've got to do it with other people. You've got to build together. So I encourage you to do that. I want you to know that the Conference Council on Youth Ministry, the Board of Church and Society, the Commission on Status and Role of Women, and the United Methodist Women are working together on a public awareness campaign around human trafficking. Now it's hard to translate that to worship on Sunday morning, but it sure expresses the power of God in our lives. You need to think about ways to connect with people in new and variety of ways. Our our Commission on Religion and Race, our Board of Church and Society, our Conference Council on Youth Ministries are co-hosting a banquet tonight. Hallelujah! And they're talking about holy conferencing. Tomorrow night, we're going to have a Hispanic task force gathering. If any of you aren't sure what to do, come on over. We're working toward Hispanic ministries because we've learned that, you know, 70% of Hispanics settling in Ohio already speak English. This is a cultural equation, not just an equation about language. 
What I want you to know is East and West Ohio cabinets are working together to understand the dynamics of the economy we're working in. We see hope, we see possibility. Kay Wolfinger is working with young adults, early career, college, and youth ministries and doing a phenomenal job. We are excited Gary Jones with Camping Ministries has also picked up in that portfolio the idea of spiritual formation and Christian education. You realize and you remember before what we talked about last year, one week at camp gives more attention and exposure to the gospel of Jesus Christ than an entire year in Sunday school. Think about that. You want to be out and getting your folks involved in that type of spiritual formation. So I see hope, I see possibility. People have asked me, Steve, what's it like in this job? And I'll tell you, it's crazy. But I see lots of possibilities because we see the church recognizing what happens when you move beyond just your local setting into networks and into work with other people. I think the state of our conference is great because God is great and God is already at work. So we're going to invite Karen now to talk about how Cabinet has been working with us to help align resources in our conference. This is the third year that we've been talking about Jesus calling us. What exactly does that mean? What does it sound like and what does it look like? We first started with Jesus is calling us to be disciples and talked a little bit about what that sounded like. And then last year, how Jesus was calling us in to be communities and we were shaped as communities and from those communities, great things can happen. And this year, from all those things we've talked about the last couple years, from there we go up, up, up from the ground, up from the grave, up from our rock and our foundation. We are called, and Jesus is calling us to encourage one another and to build up, as directed in 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Now, to build, you need materials, right? Some kind of building materials. So some of that is what you've already heard about here today. You heard Jessica Vargo talking to us a little bit about our, our financial resources and materials. And remember the story in the Bible where the ancient Hebrews all brought something that they made or was treasured and that was needed for building up the tabernacle in the wilderness? That's you, East Ohio. You are the ones. Every single bit that we bring allows us to do building up and encouraging for missions and for local churches and for outreach and for some of these things that you might have a passion about. You're all a part of that. And then you just heard Steve Court, who also talked about passions. And he talked about some new ways that there's communication and cooperation and connections to make sure that some of the resources and the materials that are available in the conference that has already flowed this direction flow back to the, again, to the places where you have passions, to the local church where the building is actually going on. And doesn't that make a lot of sense? Now, as a district superintendent and a member of the cabinet, I have an opportunity to have kind of a different viewpoint of where building is going on. Now, you in the local churches, you're, there, you're right there at the building site, so you're in the middle of it. But when you're on a district, you get a chance to kind of see across the district what's happening and across the conference. And to see over the course of the year where things are being built up, where they're being changed. And so that's what I want to talk about today, which is what does that look like, this building up process? And I'm going to start by saying it can be really messy. <laughs> Have any of you ever been on a construction site? It's dirty. There's delays. People get aggravated. You've got to redo the plans. You're waiting for permits. There's arguments over money. Well, it's, it looks the same in church when we're changing and we're building up. It can be messy, and it's always going to be difficult. But it is happening. We are encouraging up, praying up, and building up. And what are the materials that we're using? Well, I kind of like the way Jesus' words in the message are paraphrased when he's sending out the followers in twos. 
And, it's, and he says to them, you are the equipment. And I think we can use that and say, I can say, you are the materials. You, you are the Reese's, You're, you are the materials for the building up process that is happening. You are the materials. And so what exactly does that mean? And what does it look like? Well, I'll tell you what it looks like. That's what I'm here to tell you today. Here's what it looks like. It looks like church now being done in more and more different creative ways, in teams, in collaboration, across regions, cooperation, creativity. It's new team ministries happening in, in Warren and Sandusky and Ashland. It's merged church systems like New Leaf in Conneaut and Hope in Bedford and Bucyrus United Methodist Church where they are able with those combined resources and building materials that they have to be reaching out into the community with new life and hope. It is materials flowing out from Church of the Lakes and Church Hill and Garfield Memorials that, that are going to new churches, new communities, new neighborhoods with what is needed. And the, the other thing that I'm seeing over and over again is pastors and churches finding ways to talk to each other in groups and cooperate in groups one way or another, whether it's a group that's kind of organized or a group that they create on themselves, they're starting to have conversations more and more. This is what we are seeing happening, this encouraging building up. So we know the Compass groups are now becoming coaching groups so that change can actually be happen, happening consistently. And anybody who's coming into ministry is now mentored in a group. In a district like Southern Hills, where there are fewer elders amongst the appointments, there's all kinds of sharing going on. This happens other places, but it's really happened a lot there. Sharing going on so that the sacraments are served, and there is leadership, and there is people preaching. And this is done in all kinds of connectional and cooperative ways. Local pastors continue to carve out time to be together for mentoring, for fellowship. And I will remind you, and you really don't need this reminder, but I will remind you that this is on top of many of them serving multiple point charges, working in secular jobs, and progressing in the course of study. And they're still doing that kind of thing. Yes, <laughs> I agree. Laity, I love this story. Laity, we start hearing stories that laity, when they get together, are swapping stories. That's a way of encouragement, where you start swapping stories. This is the way we do it. This is the way we do it. This is how we're doing change. This is how we're building up. That's what encouragement looks like, folks. And when we do this kind of cooperation, encouragement, you know what's happening? This is what we see. This is what's happening. We are feeding people, teaching children, Responding to disaster, celebrating recovery, offering Christ, and making disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what happens when we do this kind of cooperation. Now, don't forget that I said it's not pretty and it's not easy. When Jesus sent out his disciples, one of the things he said to them is, you're going to have to leave your stuff behind. A lot of building up requires tearing down first. Many of you have seen building and you know how that works. If you're going to build something new up, you've got to tear something else down first. And so that's what it might look like. So let me give you an example of what that kind of thing looks like. It looks like churches who have raised up leaders within themselves, who then need to send them out for somebody else. They're no, they, you can't hang on to them and say, no, they just need to build us up here. They're being sent out places or shared in some way. Or it looks like a church that gave up worship in its own building, its own space, its own church sanctuary on Easter Sunday so that all the people, including the, the teenagers, that they had built a relationship with over the past year could worship together with them in the high school auditorium. And that's exactly what Lincoln Avenue Church did in Shadyside this past year. Incredible. This is what happens. You are the materials. We have what we need when we work together to build up. And then finally, and most importantly, what the other thing we are seeing happen is that when people work together, that is when you're more willing to take risks and try new things and make a change, even though it's going to be messy. And we have seen, that's what we see, that when people start working together, they start asking questions like, what if? And what's the change? And what, are, what is it going to take to get that done? Not so long ago, a DS was having a meeting in a church and um, they were being asked to take some risks, to share their materials, their resources in a new way, to embrace and open themselves to uh, an experience for young people that was happening 
from, with outside leadership in their church on Sunday evenings. And there was resistance to this. There was a lot of doubt. They, you know, they couldn't quite see what this was going to look like when it was built. And there was, there was criticism and negativity from the core members of this congregation. And then at that meeting, there was also a young woman named Lindsay. And Lindsay spoke up with a word of encouragement that was needed. She said, you know what? I've been going to this church all my life. And you built me up. You loved me through all the different, you know, when I was growing up and going to school and graduating and all those things, you built me up and encouraged me all this time. And that's why I still come to church here on Sunday morning. But I also come back on Sunday evening for that other experience because I still need to be built up and encouraged. So there was Lindsay, who has been built up by the church, now becoming a builder and encourager, but still needing that building to increase and continue. And it can be done because you are the materials, and Jesus is calling us to encourage one another and to build up. Thank you. What a great report. They started with bad news, and then they had good news, and then they had hope. And they also gave us some examples of how God is working among us, even though collectively we've got a lot of work to do. Let's express our appreciation again to Jessica, Steve, and to Karen one more time.